There's a few news things. So the uh, Republicans are vigorously passing laws to alter the way elections are resolved, hundreds of them, to try to give themselves an advantage in the election because the uh, Republicans have very strongly decided to be like the South African minority government. Instead of appealing to more people, they just want to block other people from voting so they can continue to rule without ever getting a majority, which is what they've done for the last 20 or 30 years, and they're doubling down on it. So now, uh, you may remember during the last election, Trump, this is part of why Trump sent the people to attack Pence. He wanted him to ignore the electors that were chosen by the votes and just appoint electors that would vote, that would make him the president without bothering to actually win the votes. And they're trying to make this the law in a few states, and Arizona is one of them. They're trying to add a law that would allow the state legislator to just replace the electors chosen based on votes with other electors chosen to suit the legislature. So uh, if they succeed, this would be the end of democracy. It would be just, they would be appointed by the legislature. But of course, the, um, the interesting thing, which I don't think I realized when I saw historical collapses of democracy, is of course the people doing this vigorously feel that they're saving democracy because Trump has got them convinced that he won and that they can't count the votes somehow. And uh, I guess that's probably true in other places where democracies collapse into autocracy. The people doing it probably feel like they're doing the right thing. I don't know, but they certainly strongly feel like they're doing the right thing here. A democracy in Arizona, yes. Um, the, the end result of this is that the votes are in presidential elections in Arizona would no longer count. Uh, this is what uh, China did to Hong Kong about 20 years ago. They said, you can hold elections, but if we don't like the person you elect, we have veto power to just cancel the election. And that's what the uh, GOP wants in, um, in Arizona. And, you know, so, I mean, other, other nations do this. And, uh, you know, the original point of the Electoral College in America was that we really don't trust straight democracy like Athens. We have this board of people that are supposed to review what the people vote on and decide whether it makes sense. And that's also what political parties are supposed to be. You don't let the people vote for whoever they want. You have experts in the parties choose candidates, and you have to choose from that list of candidates. So that you, that because all of this is uh, to try to make the system more stable by sort of mixing the idea of nobility, rather these special people that are smarter, with this idea of democracy, which they thought was too unstable and they don't trust it. And so you try to mix these uh, systems together. So this would be a significant alteration in the mix in America <clears throat> if they get this stuff through. Uh, so California tried to pass a net neutrality law years ago. And their idea of net neutrality is that uh, internet service providers are not allowed to favor certain kinds of traffic over other kinds of traffic, which they've certainly been doing. And um, Ajit Pai, running the FCC, blocked them from enforcing this law. And now apparently they're going to be allowed to enforce this law. So there may be some alteration in the internet filtering in California. Uh, when this was hit, hitting the news maybe about six years ago, there were tools you could get from the EFF to run to see if your internet service provider is blocking um, other movie streaming sites and stuff. And often they are. So we'll see um, where that goes. Fries is gone. A lot of my students love fries, getting discount electronics. They just took down their website, didn't tell the staff or anything, just closed. It was flying around last night. I'm not even sure they have an official announcement yet, but rumors leaked out last night. Uh, it is uh, surprising that such a long established business wouldn't at least shut down in an orderly way, giving people some, uh, some warning or something, but they seem to have just uh, quit and walked away. So this is, um, as you, I'm sure, know, for the last four years, one of the big policies of the Trump administration was to blame China for everything and blame Russia for nothing. And of course, China is doing a lot of rotten things. And so now they want to block Chinese students from coming to America and taking technology courses. And uh, so there's arguments about it. These people say that it is absolutely true that some of those students are spies and some of them take the information back to China and give China a competitive edge. But uh, a lot of them benefit America. Some of them stay here. And, and you know, scientific and artistic collaboration between nations might be what keeps us on a peaceful track. Anyway, that's their argument. Um, certainly, 
they do a lot of rotten things in China, and right now they're crushing Hong Kong um, with really oppressive, uh, crushing their democracy totally. So, you know, we're very mad at China, and uh, whether we're going to continue to block the students for that reason is currently under debate. <clears throat> uh, the quantum computers are getting faster. These D-Wave computers that some people have been criticizing have been solving some problems very fast. They're not general purpose computers, but you can carefully configure a computer to solve one problem, and some problems get much faster. So within 10 or 20 years, these things should alter our cryptographic systems. And so the cryptographic uh, quantum resistant cryptography should be officially um, certified next year and there will be official quantum resistant algorithms that we should start using. Um, countries are trying to mitigate their, migrate their production off of China dependency. Yes, we're certainly trying to do that too. Yes, it would, um, in the same spirit, it doesn't make sense that we build everything, especially our military and government systems with Chinese chips. That does seem to be a very unwise uh, procedure if we're going to have a hostile relationship with China. So. Yeah, anyway, so um, those are issues. And I see it's up to 10 after, so I think I'm just going to skip that and that. All right, so here we are. This is 128. And uh, this week, we're going to do another part of attacking Android applications. Next week, there's a special event, a Wireshark captured a flag. If you don't know Wireshark, it's definitely a good thing to learn. Irvin will be here doing this. So uh, we'll do that instead of a lecture. And I highly recommend it. It's worth extra credit if you want to do it. Um, and then we'll resume as normal. And so let me just get into the slides, which I might still have open somewhere. Oh, that's right. I think my flow is that I will have closed it because I had to post the revised slides up on my website. So there it is. OK. I made some very minor revisions in the slide. 7B. All right. I don't know why 7A is up there. All right, anyway. All right. And uh, yeah, that looks all right. Might be better to do this. All right. So here we are. This is the second part of attacking application components. And these other topics are going to be in the next lecture. That picture is a little creepy. Which picture? Well, anyway. All right. That, that may be. Anyway, so, um, all right. We talked about this. Oh, Irvin's. Yeah, that's his, his chosen, uh, yeah, his snowman. Yeah, that's what he uses on our newscast sometimes. Anyway, um, so we talked about the sandbox model for um, Android. Each app runs as a separate user account, and the users can't tread into the other user's data. So that might be nice, but sometimes you want to send a signal from one app to another. Like one app might have something that opens a web page or something, and then you want to send that over to a web browser. So um, this is easier to trust boundaries. And so there are a bunch of systems where one app can send a signal to another app by using intents or other things. These are little signals inside the operating system like interrupts that go from one signal to another. <clears throat> and so if you have a login screen and then other parts of your app are only supposed to be visible after you log in, you have to make sure that you cannot directly jump to those other pages without passing through the authentication mechanism. And so here's the failed trust boundary we talked about before. Civ is the vulnerable password manager where you can save a password and you can get to the settings option before you log in. You can log in here, but you can get to settings right there. So that's a flaw. There's part of it that should only be available after you've logged in that you can get to before you log in. And it's one of many flaws in this app. So if you look at the exported activities with Drozer, then you'll see, uh, let's see, okay, that's good. All right, so here's the various activities and you've got a main login. This is what you typically have. You, in fact, I, I was doing auditing another bunch of apps today and the more secure ones just export one activity and it's the main login. So you get the opening page and that's the only thing you can reach 
to start the app. Everything else has to be reached from a page inside the app so we can control the flow. But here it's letting the PW list be available from the outside. Uh, you can see the unexported activities with minus U and you'll see all the pages in the app like a welcome and something about a pin and something about a short login and settings. These are all these things that are available inside the app. The hidden activities. Here's the exported activities and there's the hidden activities. Now if you're root of course you can jump right to the hidden activities and then the Android sandbox is useless. That's why elevating privilege to root is enough to break out of the sandbox and elevating to root is often quite easy. It's a routine activity on in uh, penetration testing and hacking and uh, there's just an endless series of privilege escalation vulnerabilities. <coughs> so the Android sandbox is not really that strong. All right, so for example, if I try to open the pin activity up here, the pin activity was down here. It's not exported, it's hidden. So if I try to run it through Drozer, Drozer is another app on the phone, it's not root. So if I try to run this activity from Drozer, it will say permission denial. You're not allowed to do that because it was not exported from user ID 130 and I'm some other user ID, whatever the user ID of Drozer is. But if I run with the shell as root, I can then use the activity manager um, command and just execute it from here and it will start that intent and show the page. So you can't really hide anything from root. All right, and then you see settings. All right, so another thing you can look at is the content providers. The content providers are the databases. Now, if they're not explicitly marked exported equals false and you're running on a really old version of Android or you've written your app targeting a really old version of Android, then it will automatically export it. Um, but you can check with Drozer. If you run app provider info on your app, it will show you the exported apps. And this is what we did on uh, Civ. And you can see, let me just adjust this, that's pretty good, that the uh, this place path of slash keys requires permission, read keys and write keys, but that's the only place where permissions are required. It's not required for the DB content provider. Uh, if you go to some other path, only if the path exactly matches this string slash keys will you require this permission to act on it. And that means <clears throat> You can, you can look for URI paths, which are the paths referring to the data, and it finds three of them here, keys with a slash at the end, passwords and passwords. And so you can go to the passwords one, you can just query for passwords, and you don't need any permission. So anybody can go there and they can get this uh, hashed password and the username, so they get some information. And by the way, even if you cannot decrypt this encrypted stuff, you can still exploit it. For example, you could duplicate it. You can make another account with the same password. Uh, I'm not quite sure what good that would do it, but it is one thing you can do with that kind of flaw, the replay attack of sorts. On Windows systems, by the way, you can often use the hash to log in over a network without cracking it. You just pass the hash. All right, so you can do a content query um, you can also do all this stuff. Drozer is really not doing that much. And I saw a page from F-Secure today saying they're no longer developing Drozer. Um, you can do all the Drozer stuff from the command line anyway. But anyway, I am still uh, think it's worth learning Drozer. And I even found a new vulnerability today with Drozer, which you'll see in a new project. So uh, it's, I'm finally getting to see some good stuff out of Drozer. Anyway, you can find the unexported content providers with minus U. <coughs> and then you'll see which ones are limited to the app. And then there's the thing we did last time, SQL injection. It SQL, runs SQL Lite in the Android app, which is just another version of SQL. And you've got these select projection from the table with this table name, where selection equals something, order by something. And so, for example, if you're going into the system folder and you want everything, then that is select star from system. Just like any other SQL, this will get all the data out of that table. A simple version of it. And so here, when I provide a query, to look here, I define the projection. And if I project a quote, then I break the syntax and I get this uh, unrecognized token and a fragment of code from passwords. 
which is uh, what was left over after it matched that quote. So that shows a SQL injection vulnerability, and you can therefore do an injection like this that will just get all the data out of the table. So this gets me all the table um, names. So there's a metadata, a password, and a key table. And then I can dump the contents of the key table with star from key, and I'll get the passwords and PIN, the PIN in plain text, and the password in plain text. This is not the login password for the user. This is the login password for the app, which you could use to log into the app, and then you'd see all the stored passwords. All right, and I could also find the tables. If I just do scanner provider SQL tables, it will just get me the names of the tables this way, so I don't need to format that other query. It's a more cleaner way to get the same results. All right, and by the way, there's a cool feature in Drozier that only seemed to work in really old versions, unfortunately. You can bind the provider to a port, and then you can export your databases as a web page. So I had to use older Android versions. Now you can listen on port 8080, and you'll see a web interface into here. And now you can use web attackers uh, tools like SQL Map to attack them. So it's pretty cool, but it only worked on older versions of Android when I tried it. So I did not put it in the projects. All right, there, and as I mentioned before, the most serious vulnerabilities in the early days were made by Google in the heart of Android itself. And of course, if they make a mistake in there, that affects every phone, and that's really important. But um, then after that, the next most likely place you'd find vulnerabilities is in the pre-installed software by the phone manufacturers. Just like on Windows, the phone manufacturers put software on the phone, and it tends to be junky stuff with vulnerabilities. So there were a lot of installed apps that, that would expose your email and instant messages and so on with vulnerable um, apps. And this was because the apps stored all that data in content providers, and the content providers did not require permissions because the developers didn't understand what was going on well enough, and they had a SQL injection. So these insecure content providers would just hand out all that data the way that ES File Explorer did, which you have been using in the projects where you can explore your files and also you're sharing them with the whole world out a uh, port 5888 or something without it telling you. So you can have content providers and you can uh, connect them to files. There's a thing called a file backed content provider where it's going to open a file and then serve it up as a content provider. And if you're going to do that, you have to validate the URI or you get local file inclusion, where you can refer to other files on the system and it will serve that up through the content provider. So here's local file inclusion in Civ. If you read the comment here, the file backup provider is supposed to point to the location where you had a backup. And you can then read the data from a backup, but you can just replace this with a path like system, etc. hosts, and then you see the hosts file, which contains IP addresses, and it just demonstrates that you're able to read a different file in the machine, so that's local file inclusion. And you can, uh, I was able to get this con the password from the, uh, and I see idiot facebook.com and Twitter user 15. I was able to get information uh, from the database by just browsing to the database. It was database.db.wall in the databases directory. So I was able to use this file inclusion to just walk into the data. Remember, this is slash data, data, where all the data for all the apps live. Here's the name of the app, databases, the name of the database. And so you get a, a binary file, which is a SQLite database but it has some unprintable characters and it has the data. It's not encrypted, so you can see the data here. So a file inclusion vulnerability can be all it takes to see it. All right, and the point of this, of course, is I am reading, I'm using the app's content provider, so it has the permission to read the app's data. You could also regard this as a horizontal privilege escalation from Drozer, I'm able to move over to the app and use the app's permission to read the app's data, even though Drozer does not have the direct permission to reach into this folder that belongs to a different app, data, data, example, civ.com. I can trick the app into handing me that data. All right, so if you want to detect this, there's a, a scanner to detect traversal vulnerabilities here, and then it will tell you there is a vulnerable provider, and there it is. The file backup provider has a uh, traversal vulnerability. 
And so here, the keys path would require read keys and write keys to use it. But um, if you look in the manifest, you see that here. This is how it's described in the basic manifest file for this. You have read permission and write permission for path equals keys. But that is just this one. It must exactly match that path. So if I instead, if I try to read keys without a slash, I will get a permission denial. But if I just add a slash to the end, I get right in. Because this path has the same significance, but it does not match the pattern in the manifest file, so the permissions do not apply. So that is very rude. <coughs> and I mentioned before, the same thing happens to a lot of PHP permissions on web servers, because PHP permissions are handled the same way, and people often incorrectly specify them in Apache configuration files. And uh, there are variants of the ways to refer to the PHP file, which escape the permissions. All right. And then you can attack the servers. Um, the services, rather. So services are things that run in the background that keep running even when the app is not in the foreground. You're right from other app in front. And you start the service with an intent. You can also bind an app to a service, so it sends data back and forth, and we'll talk a little more about that as we go ahead. These things, so it's unprotected started services. You can start a service, and um, you can set the service to automatically do something when it launches. So when you start it, you can start it from an intent, and the intent can have parameters, and you might have vulnerabilities in those parameters, like the ones we've talked about, ways to refer to a file, and if that's true, there might be a way to set an intent launching the service and do something unexpected. Um, all right. And in Drozer, it's run app service start if you want to start services. In 2012, on Samsung again, there was a clipboard service where you could save a file in the clipboard and then move that file to another app on the clipboard. And therefore, there were ways to save a file and move it to a high privilege app and execute it with high privileges. And then you'd have a privilege escalation. And so you could use a package to install another package by putting it in the clipboard and moving it to some other app that would then install it. So uh, the clipboard is actually uh, pretty risky. Well, everybody uses it all the time. The clipboard is, of course, shared by all apps and commonly used to copy passwords back and forth. So it does provide a, uh, a vulnerability. Then there's unexported services, of course. And if you have an unexported service, it cannot be started by anybody except that app or by root. All right, and root can start anything, of course. Root can violate the sandbox. All right, then there are bound services. Now, there's a lot of things. There are different kinds of services, and I found a link that lists them. There's like three different kinds and then two subkinds. They all do about the same thing. There are minor differences. Some are more efficient and respond faster and things like that that developers care about. But for our point of view, they're all pretty much the same. So you can make a bound service that will have an I binder, and this is what you can make remote procedure calls. Um, and a bound service um, can only be bound to by other parts of the same app. So this is a way for different parts of the app to talk to each other. How risky are encrypted generic browser password managers? That's a good question, and I do not know the answer. Um, uh, there have been some vulnerabilities. I know LastPass got hacked a few years ago. I think one pass might have got hacked. Um, so, you know, if you put all of them pretty much put your passwords in the web so you can get them on another device like iCloud. And, you know, I highly recommend using a password manager because the number one risk people have is password reuse. If you don't use a password manager, you pretty much have to memorize a few passwords and keep using them over and over. Built into the browser, oh, the ones built into the browser. Um, I don't recommend those very much, um, all, although I haven't seen it in the news lately. Uh, there was a time when they got hacked pretty often. Those are pretty high, um, high value targets, like the one built into Internet Explorer. Um, so uh, however they exist, I'm sure a lot of people use them. But I mean, it's generally best to be a little bit off the beaten path. I would recommend using a third party plugin like LastPass just on general principles. If you use the standard thing that most everybody uses, that's probably going to get hacked more often. How can they be transferred to the clipboard? Are they not limited to text? They are limited. Oh, yeah. Well, apparently, you could put a file. Perhaps you put a path to the file. It's a good question. I haven't looked into it. 
I think it is limited to text, so I guess you'd put a path in, but maybe you can put a file on the clipboard. I know in Windows you can put images in the clipboard and such. Does that include browser extensions from third parties? Well, I think you'd probably be safer to use browser extensions from third parties. But this is um, this is just this is security through obscurity. If you use something that only a small number of people use, it's less likely to be attacked, but it's also less likely to be patched. So in a way, probably the only thing to do is to pay primary attention to your convenience. The most important thing, the best password manager is the one you really use. So find one you like. And alphanumeric Yurks are clipboardable in Firefox. Yeah, you can always clipboard them. Anyway, the, um, all right. So that's the binder. You can also use something called a message, which is like an intent, a signal sent from one app to another. And there's something called Android's interface description language, which is another way for an app to share its code with other apps. Um, and so you can publish your um, part of your app in this language, and then another app can find it and refer to it, but it's not that commonly used. And all these things accomplish pretty much the same thing, remote procedure calls, where one app can call some code from another app. And so you can attack these things. They all have, uh, they're all taking data from some other app. So if you have a malicious app in there, like malware or Drozer or something, then it can try putting, sending up funny characters and funny messages and try to attack it. So Civ has two services, an auth service and a crypto service, and both of them are not protected by permissions, and they're exported. So external um, apps can send data to these services without any permission, and so you can look at the source code. As you know, you can just take the APK and open it in JADX and see what's in there. And if you look at the message handler, um, you'll see it's looking for code numbers, 2354, and uh, down here is 7452 for the key, and 9234 for the pin. So this is the authentication service, and it's going to do a check for these things. So you can request the password from another app. And that's, of course, the point of a password manager, right? The password manager has some way to move the password into another app, and they're doing it with um, intents. So you send uh, a message and you send it to the auth service and the message you send is these code numbers. So this will um, send these code numbers and the reply will give you the password. So that's uh, sending the password through an unprotected intent or some kind of signal between apps there. All right. So then there's broadcast receivers. Um, these are things that are taking signals from other apps. So here's an example workflow. So I have some app that wants to log in, and they put the real answers on the internet. So it takes your credentials, it sends them up to a server on the internet. If they're correct, it sends a broadcast telling you that the credentials are OK. The app receives the broadcast with an intent filter. So this is, a, for example, a sleazy, um, yeah, it could be right, yeah. This sounds like a sleazy attempt to imitate OAuth. I mean, OAuth is the right way to do it. If you want to log in with Facebook, you send the password to Facebook, and Facebook sends you an OAuth token. And, but in this case, it just sends you a signal saying those credentials were correct. And the uh, result is you can fool it, because any app could send that intent. It could just send it the signal saying the login was accepted. And it thinks it comes from third party because this was not restricted where it came from. So this is what happened, by the way, to the San Francisco parking meters. Um, the San Francisco parking meters, about 10 years ago, when you wave a card, we connect a card, the parking meter would ask the card, do you have enough money? And the card would say yes. And then it would let you have the time on the parking meter. So all you had to do is make a card that always said yes. And uh, it's the same kind of thing here. You could just send a signal claiming to have proven something without the trusted device actually checking it. Anyway, uh, it was uh, it was somebody at Noisebridge. I don't think it was Applebaum. It was Joe Grand, the guy that made the badges at DEF CON. Applebaum might have been involved. Anyway, so there were vulnerable broadcast receivers in 2013 
in the code base that would allow any app to send code send uh, phone calls? Yeah, well, actually, I don't know. I think they passed it. It was all over DEF CON. I imagine they patched it, but I never really heard. Anyway, at the, this time, any app could send phone calls. Um, all right, another thing you can do is you can sniff the intents. The intents are like signals inside the operating system, like network packets, although it's not network traffic. And you can register in your app to receive broadcasts intended for other apps. Now, if the apps don't require a permission to receive the intent, <coughs> then I can listen for intents sent by other people. So if an app sends an intent with secrets like this, if it decides to send credentials like login, or it's going to send username and PIN through an intent, through a broadcast intent, then I can sniff for it. And you sniff for it uh, in Drozer by just running app broadcast sniff. And then it will print out the intents on the screen that come by, just like Wireshark would show you the network traffic. And here you go, it shows you um, usernames and pins as they fly around. So that's pretty cute. And you can do more of this stuff. For example, there are secret codes, um, numbers on the keypad that do special things. And you can find it with run scanner misc secret codes. And I've got that running here. Let me see. I think that's working. So I've got a phone here. Same one we've been using for most things. And I've connected to it with uh, Kali here. I've got Drozer. So it is run scanner misc secret codes. Let's try it. Run scanner misc secret codes. Um, Scanner.misc.secretcodes, okay? And there you go, it shows me the secret codes going by. And notice this one here, 4636. Carrier setup, calendar, hmm, that's interesting, I didn't see those other ones. Anyway, um, the 4636 is the one I remember using from before. And I see this. I don't understand actually why there are two different answers here. This is the one I tried before that only showed me one. I'm not sure what these other ones will do. Might be fun to try them. But this one is run app broadcast info. Yeah, and it does. It gives me a whole lot of information. But here's the secret code, 4636 of type star. And you can get it on the handset with that dial. So you dial, go to your handset, and you dial. Whoa, there it is. I'm going to get rid of the old one and put it in again. All right. All right, so it is star, pound, star, pound. 46. And there you go. That puts you in this phone info screen where you can do tests. You can see your, uh, your setting. You can adjust things about the uh, cell phone connection, which is, of course, simulated here. Select radio band and so on. Yeah, anyway. Um, I'm not sure how much of this actually works in the simulator. But anyway, it puts you in this uh, configuration page, which is kind of fun. And you can also do it from a web page, which we'll do in a minute. So that's what you see here, this testing page. And uh, by Samsung Galaxy had a vulnerability that you could do a factory reset without prompting the user. So all your data is lost, all your contacts and SMS messages and everything. And you can invoke it from a web page with a tell handler. And you could put it in an iframe. This probably has to be iframe here. And therefore, um, it will automatically take effect when the page loads. And so, yeah, here it is. Here, I made this web page here, and it works on my phone. So this is the source code of the page. It's just an iframe with a tell number that has that same thing we just, just typed. Percent 23, I think, is the pound. So this types off that number. And so if I bring up in Firefox, and right there's the page. 
So if I refresh this page, I guess I can just press Enter. Yeah, and the iframe didn't take effect immediately, but I can click here to make it take effect. And when I click, it should dial that number, although it looks like somehow, yeah, there it goes. It's just slow. Yep. It loaded it. Oh, and I thought it ran it right away. Maybe it just loads it and then you have to hit this. Anyway. Um, well, it looks like I'm having strange consequences of my, uh, my demonstration here. Let me try this again. It's AD Sam's Class Info 128 settings. All right, I want to get a clean copy of this page. I'm going to get the wrong page so it'll show me the error message and then the right page to try to get a clean copy. Okay. Now, if I click there, what does it do? I thought it opened up the page, but it doesn't. It just prepares it. Oh, okay. All right. So it doesn't automatically dial it on this phone. And even when I run it, it doesn't have effect. So anyway, I think on older versions of my Android simulators, it did work. Anyway, it's fun to try these things and see how they work, and there may be ways to improve it. So I've got some cahoots. They're up here. Seven B, okay. Well, I think the delay is the same for everybody. All right. All right. So what makes a screen pop up from Joseph? Yeah, the exported activity. And by the way, the delay is very small today. It's about two seconds, much less than usual. Anyway. All right, which one is vulnerable to SQL injection? I've got Comcast. And it seems fast sometimes and slow sometimes, and the speed test seems to have nothing to do with the actual experience. I think there must be latency issues and DNS latency and stuff, other things that affect the connection, other than whatever a speed test picks up. Hmm. Oh, well, if the lag varies from student to student, that's not good. Oh, not much I can do about it. Anyway, it's the exported content provider that you can reach from Drozel.
Well, if it depends on the student's internet connection, then this is like the stock market, where the people with a fast connection get the money. All right, which one allowed privilege escalation via the clipboard? Yeah, it was the service that ran on the Samsung devices. All right, what component does intent sniffing? Well, I don't think Comcast controls who I run my speed test against. I use other services, but I think there are subtleties of the connection. Like I know when I listen to podcasts, a bunch of them refuse to load and I have to try two and three times for them to load. So something like DNS times out or something. Anyway, broadcast receivers are about pickup intents. All right. Last two look like real names. The telephone will have to tell me who they are if they want their points. Anyway, I closed Kahoot. There it is. All right, so I'm going to stop this one.